the 1920s, though they started as a bleak period as far as chances of peace were concerned, uh, tended to end with certain glimmer of hope. The Locarno Pact, the Brian Kellogg Pact, which banned war as an instrument of national policy, restoration and revival of German economy, of international trade, all these uh, tended to create an ambience of uh, peace and understanding. The glimmer of hope, however, was extinguished by the Great Depression of 1929-30. This was a watershed as the Great Depression has indeed been the beginning of a nightmare. It resulted in total disruption of uh, economic uh, exchanges, domestic internal crisis resulting in glut of uh, production, uh, in industrial recession, massive unemployment, uh, obviously spawning political turmoil and social discontent. The fallout of this Great Depression uh, was not purely economic in nature. It had political implications as well because most of the countries now tended to adopt a policy of extreme economic nationalism. Tariff barriers were erected and uh, indeed uh, an aggressive posture uh, characterized uh, economic policy and it was very soon to affect political uh, strategies as well. Most of the countries went off the gold standard and they all resorted to a very, very uh, aggressive and, and uh, intensely nationalistic kind of uh, policies in order to overcome the crisis of massive employment, internal, uh, huge internal and foreign debt, etc. The states tended to uh, veer towards radical solutions like massive state expenditure uh, for job creation and huge investment in military production. The most serious fallout was perhaps the rise of Adolf Hitler in Germany. Under Gustav Stresemann, Germany was once again accepted as a significant and important member of the Committee of Nations in Europe. The death of Stresemann followed by the impact of this Great Depression once again put the German politics in doldrums. Between 1930 and 32, on the one hand, the elections proved to be increasingly uh, indecisive. On the other hand, there was uh, a rise of radical political formations, the communists on the left and the Nazis on the right. The social democrats failed to gain absolute majority and indeed the communists and the Nazis registered significant, indeed massive electoral gains in these successive elections during these two years. These two years were also the years of street fighting in Germany. The streets of Berlin and major other cities, as well as minor towns in many parts of Germany, had been infested with the brown shirt brigade of the Nazi party, who unleashed a veritable terror on all, particularly the communists, trying to break trade union movement strikes, etc., which were rampant uh, as a result of the economic crisis. Ultimately, when the Nazis emerged as the single largest political party in the Reichstag or the parliament, President Hindenburg invited Hitler to become the chancellor of Germany. And once Hitler became the chancellor, his first actions had been to repudiate uh, all reparation obligations, to withdraw Germany from the disarmament conference and then from the League. Hitler did not immediately switch on to an aggressive posture, but his early protestations of peace notwithstanding, there was no doubt that Hitler stood for German aggressive foreign policy. We have looked at Hitler's foreign policy in some details 
in another lecture. Here we would like to look at uh, the major other events that made war almost unavoidable in the second half of the 1930s. It is possible to argue that after 1935, war did increasingly appear to be a major option. The League of Nations had a few minor successes in the 1920s. Indeed, as we have seen, the League was always keen to try and evolve so that the League could play a more effective role in enhancing peace and in resolving uh, disputes or conflicts arising amongst the nations. But uh, it, 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 it increasingly, the League was being marginalized. In many countries, there had been rise of uh, fascist regimes or, or extreme right-wing regimes. Germany, where the Nazis had come to power, Italy, where the fascists under Mussolini had already been in power. In Portugal, Salazar emerged as the dictator and kept power for a long time. In Spain, which had a republic, the uh, Republican government was soon to be challenged by Falange, a uh, right-wing formation, fascist formation. <laughs> when Hitler, after coming to power in 1934, tried to achieve the Anschluss expressly prohibited by the Treaty of Versailles, by intervening in Austria, Mussolini was alarmed because Italy shared with Austria a common frontier and Mussolini feared that an expansive Germany by uh, achieving the Anschluss of the Union with Austria would pose a threat to Mussolini's border and might invade Italy also through the Brenner Pass. So Mussolini now tended to rise with the Western democracies with England and France. They had uh, uh, condemned the violations by Hitler of the provisions of the Treaty of uh, Versailles, like introduction of conscription, announcement of the existence of the Luftwaffe or the Air Force, and the expansion or his plans for expanding the <coughs> army as well. And they met at a place called Stresa, and this led to the emergence of the so-called Stresa Front. This demonstrated that Mussolini's uh, interest for the present was more anti-German than anti-peace or anti-Western uh, democracies. But very soon, over the issue of Italy's interest in Abyssinia, this was to be transformed and result in a silent diplomatic revolution, as it were. Italy had long coveted Abyssinia as a colony. In fact, Italy had hardly uh, recovered from the trauma of defeat at the hands of Abyssinia uh, at the Battle of Adua in 1896. The stigma of defeat, in a way, uh, stuck in the Italian psyche, as it were, and Italy, particularly Mussolini, was very keen to uh, avenge that uh, defeat. Italy had expected that the peace settlement of Versailles, as per the terms of the Treaty of London, would acknowledge Italy's predominant uh, interests, economic interests in East Africa, or shall we say colonial interest in East Africa. In fact, Italy was promised that if Germany, if, if England and France uh, made some gains at the cost of Germany, Italy would also be compensated, but Italy wasn't. In the early uh, years after the war, Italy tried to cultivate Abyssinian friendship. In 1923, Abyssinia joined the League under Italy's sponsorship, and in 1928, a treaty of friendship and arbitration was concluded with, with them. But in 1930, Haile Selassie uh, was crowned as emperor, but he was determined to rescue Ethiopia from chaos and to put the house in order. This was inconvenient as far as Italy's vital 
economic interests in the area were concerned. By the end of the 1920s, France was apprehensive of a German revival and was almost willing to give Italy a free hand in Abyssinia. Britain, however, was not that keen. In 1935, the French Foreign Minister Pierre Laval visited Rome and signed a few agreements with Italy. One of these was made public, the other was uh, supposed to be secret. The open public one said that France had uh, uh, ceded certain uh, modest amount of worthless lands to the Italian colonies of Libya and Eritrea. Well, the secret later allegedly indicated France's economic disinterest in Abyssinia. There was a controversy about the content of this secret agreement. Mussolini later claimed that France had indeed given him a free hand in Abyssinia, but this the French denied. Whatever the truth of this uh, matter, the Laval visit to Rome was indeed uh, seen by Mussolini as a green signal to him for a free, uh, kind of a free hand in uh, uh, Ethiopia or Abyssinia. So Mussolini now felt bold enough to be on the aggressive, taking advantage of uh, France and Britain's initial discomfiture with Germany. Mussolini felt that if he wanted to risk a war in uh, Africa, he should do that before Germany became too powerful. And the stress up front, he felt, had given him this. Britain had some problem because a peace ballot in 1935 indicated that 74% of people were willing to support non-military sanction in case of aggression and another 70% indeed said that they were willing to support war if that became the only option to stop aggression. Britain felt that negotiation might or mediation might help resolve the crisis. They agreed to cede some part of British Somaliland to Ethiopia to persuade Ethiopia to part with Ogaden to Italy. Uh, the British session would provide Ethiopia with the access to the sea. Ethiopia did not accept this and in 1935, June 1935 came the Anglo-German Naval Agreement which France viewed with a lot of disfavor for this allowed Germany to acquire a navy which she did not have any. Italy invaded Abyssinia in October uh, 1935 as British attempts at mediation failed. Ethiopia immediately appealed to the League and the League was uh, able to take action. League imposed sanctions but significantly oil was taken out of the list of commodities on which sanction was imposed. This was uh, curious because uh, Italy did not produce any oil and this would have, uh, a ban here would have put her in considerable jeopardy. But the argument was that she could buy it uh, from elsewhere, for example from USA. Nevertheless, it showed that France and Britain's determination to resist Italy was tentative and rather half-hearted. On the other hand, Sir Samuel Hoare, the British Foreign Secretary, on a skiing visit to Switzerland, stopped over at, in Paris and uh, made an agreement with Pierre Laval. It, uh, the content was not made open, but before the agreement was signed formally, its contents leaked in the press and there was a furore of public opinion both in France and England. Allegedly, the whole Laval agreement wanted to persuade Ethiopia to part with two-thirds of its territory and this would have virtually uh, resulted in an abrogation of, uh, an, an abdication of it, uh, Abyssinian sovereignty. Instead, Ethiopia was to remain a small but compact ethnic state. The agreement obviously uh, could never be ratified and uh, public opinion uh, 
demanded a more stringent enforcement of the and uh, of, of the sanctions but this could never really be done and italian invasion of abyssinia proceeded without any serious military opposition and by may 1936 haile selassie went in exile and the italian king was proclaimed the emperor of ethiopia this was the first major act of aggression in europe after the war and neither the league nor the major powers could do anything decisive Mussolini was now accepting uh, the point of view of Count Chiano, his foreign minister, that Mussolini should veer towards <clears throat> Germany. And it was very clear that after this aggression, Mussolini increasingly was inclined to accept friendship with Germany. The Stresa front was hopelessly broken and the Rome-Berlin axis was established by 1936. This was even further cemented when the anti comintern pact with Japan was acceded to by Italy as well in uh, November 1937, thereby extending the Rome-Berlin axis to the Rome-Berlin-Tokyo axis. You see, the countries which were responsible uh, for the major aggression, acts of aggression, were uh, being, the, the formation had emerged by 1937. Japan had earlier uh, invaded Manchuria in 1931. The League failed to do anything, though it tried. Japan left the League, and after 1937, Japanese career of aggression in, in China, for example, uh, became more intense, and Japan openly declared its intention to establish a new order in East Asia. At the same time, Germany remilitarized Rhineland in 1936 and there was nothing that any power indicated an intention of doing. So this was the first overt act of aggression outside uh, Europe by an European power about which the League, even though it tried, failed to do anything. And Britain and France, though it pretended to be doing a lot, actually ended up doing not doing much. The relations between Germany and Italy began to improve and the Spanish Civil War indeed cemented it by providing them with a good bit of practice for the eventual collaboration during the Second World War. In Spain in 1931 there was a Republican government but it faced many challenges from the beginning. A right-wing uh, formation called the Falange had emerged. It had a number of supporters in the army and it also had the support of the Catholic Church. In a way, uh, it, it, it provided a combination of the conservative and uh, backward-looking political forces, the landlords, the Catholic Church, uh, and, and uh, it was against the working class and peasant interest. Uh, something that the Republicans represented. In 1936, a popular front government was uh, returned by a massive mandate in the elections. This uh, popular front government comprised the communists, the socialists, the anarchists, and the Republican left, generally speaking. But almost from the, it, it started by uh, initiating reforms. The big estates were broken up, uh, peasants were given land, Certain actions were taken to benefit the industrial working classes as well. Liberties were restored and generally Spain was to emerge as a more liberal regime. It is at this moment that the phalanges struck and there was a revolt uh, or mutiny in the army, both in Spain and in the Spanish colonies. General Franco raised the standard of rebellion in Morocco and very soon emerged uh, as a major challenge to the Republican government and arrived in Spain later. Right through this civil war, which should have been the internal problem of a country, had become an international concern. But while Germany and Italy supported the 
efforts of the nationalists as the rebels came to be called now by providing them troops, ammunition and all kind of logistical support. The Western democracies raised the issue of non-intervention that to allow the Spanish Civil War to continue without any international intervention. Only the Soviet Union gave some support to the Republican forces, but logistically it was difficult for the Soviet Union to, to help the uh, Republicans as much as uh, Ital Italo-German forces were helping the nationalists because of the distance between Russia and Spain. And this non-intervention uh, policy uh, meant that the Republican government was denied of its legitimate right to seek international aid. It raised militia of citizens, but while the democratic states uh, abdicated uh, their responsibility, the democratic conscience of the people all over the world did not quite sleep. There was a huge surge of sympathy for the Republican cause and an international brigade was raised with volunteers from more than 50 countries. Uh, this brigade with about 40,000 people fought alongside the Republicans. The, there were even fascists from, anti-fascists from Germany and Italy. The German uh, battalion was named after Thelman, a German communist who was put in a concentration camp and then liquidated by the Nazis. The American brigade was known as the Lincoln Brigade. And Hemingway, who participated in the war, uh, puts very poignantly this. No men ever entered the earth more honorably than those who died in Spain already have achieved immortality. Even Nehru had gone to Spain to demonstrate his solidarity with the Republicans. There is a legend that when Paul Robson, the celebrated American singer, came to sing for and inspire the Republicans for two days, all hostilities were suspended and people on both sides listened to Robson's, Robson's uh, songs, spellbound and entranced. Romantic zeal, however, was no substitute for military hardware and trained soldiers. And therefore, the Spanish Civil War ended with Franco's victory and the defeat of the Republicans. It is not for nothing that it has been called the dress rehearsal of the Second World War. The new Spanish government was very soon recognized, first by USA and then by other countries. <laughs> Well, these aggressions were being uh, uh, committed, particularly by Italy and Germany. The Western powers adopted a policy of, that has been called appeasement. Neville Chamberlain was the architect of this. He was the Prime Minister of Britain along with Daladier of France. When Hitler violated the terms of the Treaty of Versailles one after the other, there was nothing that they did. When Hitler moved army into the Rhineland, the French army generals wanted to fight back, but the Prime Minister Leon Blum developed a cold feet and did not allow them to take action. They did nothing during the Abyssinian uh, War. Neither were they active during the Spanish Civil War, while Mussolini and Hitler provided all solid support to them. Indeed, when Austria, uh, when Germany took Austria in 1938, Chamberlain said that it was his, it was Germany's legitimate territorial ambition. And he even suggested that if Germany uh, achieved her territorial ambition in the East, Western Europe will have peace. The height of the policy of appeasement and international hypocrisy came at Munich in September 1938. Hitler demanded Sudetenland, saying that the Germans were being persecuted by the Czech government. Czechoslovakia was the only successful democracy in this part of Europe and therefore was a, an object of hatred as far as Hitler was concerned. And Mussolini, Hitler, Daladier and Chamberlain met at Munich, divided Czech, Czechoslovakia, gave Sudetenland to Germany and in the conference Czechoslovakia was not even 
are represented. Hitler, it was hoped, would stop there, but it did not. Hitler took the whole of Czechoslovakia in March 1939, and having concluded the Nazi-Soviet Pact in 1939, in August 1939, moved and occupied Poland on 1st September 1939. The policy of appeasement had failed. France and Britain was rudely shaken out of this policy, and after the uh, invasion of Poland by Germany, Neville Chamberlain declared in his parliament, this country is at war with Germany. This is how the Second World War started.